leaving behind a monster month of gains. Hello, August. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Futures fading down about six tenths of 1%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue. Fed watchers pushing back. The notion of a coming Fed pivot. That Fed pivot. The pivot that everybody's talking about. Central to this is the view that there'll be this immaculate disinflation. We still see core inflation accelerating. This was not a pivot from the Fed. Inflation is still what we need to be focused on. I don't think Fed is pivoting here. We don't see it. Chair Powell, in his unscripted remark, said we are at neutral. I'm not sure why Powell uh, stated that we are near it. They are selling enough optimism to the market. The market is looking for a pivot. The market is trying to force the Fed's hand. It's too early. Financial markets seem to be pivoting prematurely. This is a market that's trying to always uh, get ahead of the Fed. Joining us now to discuss Aberdeen's James Athey, Julie Beale of Kane Anderson Rudnick. We're getting pushback from current and former Fed officials. Julie, I want to go straight to the column we had from the former New York Fed President Bill Dudley this morning. He wrote the following. Investors have lately become strangely optimistic that the Federal Reserve won't have to tighten monetary policy much further. This wishful thinking is both unfounded and counterproductive. Julie, how self-defeating is this rally we're seeing play out? Well, I think it could lead to a lot of heartbreak, the way that things are set up. We would all love to be further through inflation than I think we already are. And the optimism is really based on the fact that things look very cheap after declining 50, 60, 70 percent. But they're cheap for a reason. They were expensive, and now they're probably at more reasonable levels. And I think what we have to remember is that the Fed got or tried to be pretty cute about inflation, calling it transitory. And now it's just giving us a lot of mixed messages. And I think the reason for that is we just don't know how the data is going to turn out. And so they need the breathing room. They need the flexibility to be able to make changes as the data comes in. And I think the problem for investors is we just want a lot more certainty than I think is really available to us right now. James Athey, does this Fed need to smack this one back down? It amazes me, really, that you know, for an institution which spent so long talking about financial conditions as the metric and the transmission of its policy, how little they seem to understand financial markets. You know, of course, the market is keen to get to that pivot point quickly. And of course, the market wants to be ahead of the Fed, ahead of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. But the whole reality, if you like, of financial conditions is that if the Fed allows the market to begin to think about what happens when inflation peaks and starts coming down, then it already becomes self-defeating because you get an easing of policy at a time where the Fed should still be tightening. So as usual, their communication is what gets them in a problem. And, and you know, I completely agree that this rally is, is self-defeating. Everything that's going on is exactly the opposite of what the Fed needs. Lower yield, steeper curve, weaker dollar, higher commodity prices, higher equities. This is basically another boost to an economy which is already overheating and driving inflation towards 10 percent. James Connorsen said this this morning on Twitter a Bloomberg columnist. He said where their problems stem from is affirming that long-term neutral rates are around 2.5 percent, which anchors the 10-year yield around that level, which anchors mortgage rates, which supports housing. They're not sure how to make markets do what they want. Does that resonate with you, James? Yeah. I mean, yeah, what resonates with me is what Jerome Powell was saying back in 2016, 17 and 18. And to be honest, what he was concerned about when he was a governor back in 2012. In 2017, 18, he told us to do away with the stars. These are absolutely useless. Nobody knows where they are. Nobody can measure them in real time. They are highly theoretical concepts and they are no practical use whatsoever for a central bank or for investors. I'm not too concerned about the idea of neutral. I am concerned about the extent to which rates where they are or rates where they're going are going to slow the economy, slow the economy a lot, increase unemployment, increase unemployment a lot, and therefore ultimately destroy demand and bring inflation down. And I think that's a process nobody will know. In the meantime, you need to continue tightening policy until you see that material progress towards um, you know, 2% inflation and, and, and already giving the market some hope 
about immaculate landings, soft landings and perfect policy is going in completely the opposite direction. I tell you, futures fading right now, down eight tenths of one percent, 25 minutes away from the opening bell. You remember a few hours earlier this morning, we had a report from CNN. The Speaker Pelosi is expected to visit Taiwan as part of a tour of Asia, according to a Taiwanese government official and a U.S. official as well. Further reporting from another outlet in the last hour looking for the same thing to develop. So we're down about eight tenths of one percent. Anne-Marie standing by down in D.C. We'll catch up with her a little bit later. The other story over the weekend, the pushback not just from former Fed officials, but current Fed officials as well. The Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari weighing in. Take a listen. We're going to do everything we can to try to avoid a recession, but we are committed to bringing inflation down and we are going to do what we need to do. And we are a long way away from achieving an economy that is back at 2% inflation, and that's where we need to get to. Mike McKee, more work to do. <laughs> More work to do. And I wouldn't say that they're pushing back in the sense that they're just reaffirming. Nobody said that they were going to cut back on their uh, rate rise increases. They just said they want to be data dependent. And this is the data. Let me, before I go to the week ahead, start with this. This is what really matters and is going to frame the debate. Those are two different measures of financial conditions. And as you can see, they've started loosening again. In part, <laughs> to go back to the question you asked Julie Beale, it's a self-defeating rally in the markets because it's loosening financial conditions and that doesn't help the Fed. So that is the context for this week's numbers. And this is the first week of the month when we get the big numbers. Today, S&P manufacturing PMI and, of course, ISM manufacturing. Everybody's going to be looking not only at the headline number, but at the prices paid number. And we'll take a look at the employment number to see maybe what we can tell about Friday. Tuesday, three Fed officials. They will add, no doubt, to the same comments that we heard from Neil Kashkari. Then you get jolts. We'll see how many jobs there are. And did we see a drop in auto sales because of higher rates. ISM services on Wednesday, Thursday, jobless claims, and Friday's the big day. And as you can see, we're expecting a drop in the number of jobs created, but no change in unemployment. And 250,000 is still a lot. So at this point, uh, everything is pointing to the fact that the Fed still has to do a lot more. And I wouldn't bet against 75 basis points at this point, particularly given the fact that financial conditions are loosening. Mike, is it too early for me to ask about August 10th and the next CPI print? Uh, it's not too early. We may see a drop in the headline because, of course, we saw a drop in gasoline prices. But a lot of other numbers have suggested that underlying inflation is gaining steam. So the Fed still has a lot of rooting out to do. Long path to the September meeting. More data still to come. A CPI report next week. Payrolls on Friday, as Mike McKee said. Mike, thank you. Then on to Jackson Hole later this month. Going to be alongside Mike McKee over in Jackson to weigh in on all of this a little bit later this month. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley weighed in on some of this. He said this, the equity market can dream and will dream of a better future as rates come down from a potentially more dovish Fed until it's proven wrong by the estimates collapsing, as they always do, in an actual recession. Ginny Bill, we're trading on lower yields now. When do we start to trade on why yields are lower? I think it's not just a question of yields, but I think a lot of it has to do with spreads. I think we have to be in, keep in mind that the fundamental picture is deteriorating. And I think as earnings start to come through, what we'll start to see and hear and pay attention to is sort of like when you're on a date with someone for the first time, everyone is talking about you know everything they've accomplished and how great they are. But the future seems kind of uncertain and they can't commit to anything. And I, I think that deterioration is what the recession will look like, just a gradual collapsing in how fundamentals are going to play out and strength of earnings and margins, in particular with inflation, that really has to start to play out. Julie, I'm not going to dig deeper on that particular analogy. I'll go to the next question. <laughs> What's bounced back too hard, too fast, in your opinion, in the last month? And what would you be more willing, more confident to fade? I think a lot of the cyclicals have been surprisingly strong and, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, particularly when you think about the makeup of the U.S. economy. It's a consumer economy primarily. And so a lot of these cyclicals that are touched by consumers, I don't see as being very strong. For us, it's not a question of being very defensive. It's just a focus on quality and businesses that are less tied to the consumer. I think that's a much better place to be. You've had a call on retail for a while, and our pandemic demands seemingly are being fulfilled at a point where they're no longer desired. And these retailers are now sitting on tons and tons of inventory, Julie. How do you think that's going to play out through the sector through the year ahead? 
I, you know, I think I just recently visited the ports of Los Angeles and was absolutely stunned that there is 100 acres that used to be a vacant pier that is filled completely with shipping containers. And these are not ones that are looking for truckers. The retailers don't want them because their own warehouses are full. And I think that portends really poorly for back to school and for holiday, frankly. You know, it, it, this is something that's going to maintain over a long cycle. And now you have a timing issue where the inventory is actually not where it's supposed to be when it's supposed to be because of the delays. So I think it's problematic and it's going to last and it's going to cause a lot of pessimism because people are going to be very aware of the situation and how negative it could be. Judy, where does that leave the off-price retailers? Is this a blanket bearish call on the whole segment more broadly across the whole industry group or is it concentrated around particular names? You know, I think anything that sells something that has a barcode on it where you are in the Hunger Games with Amazon is not something I want to be in. But off price has really been struggling for a while because they haven't been able to get inventory. And now let me tell you, they're going to have plenty of it. And at the end of the day, the U.S. consumer loves a deal. So, you know, you can be looking at your TJs and your Ross, but I think even better is if you're in more of a general merchandise category. So something like an Ollie's Bargain Outlets, or a grocery outlet, I think, is even better positioned. This is the issue, James Athey. We've all been asking this question over the last month. The retailers and what they're going through right now, is it just an execution problem, or do we have serious signs of a weaker consumer in America? Yeah, I think there's definitely elements of both quite clearly. You know, what's happened post-pandemic and the just-in-time global supply chain uh, shock and, and you know working through the after effects of that is obviously playing a huge part but realistically I think unfortunately there was a lot of extrapolation of unsustainable demand and therefore you've um, you know ended up with this massive inventory overhang so I do think that a good chunk of it certainly the more recent build-up in wholesale and retail inventories that we're seeing I do think that that relates to massive weakness in consumer demand it's it, it's inevitable 50 percent of U.S. consumers 50 percent of people who are submitting fed, federal income tax forms really don't pay a huge amount of federal income tax because they don't have a whole huge uh, a chunk of uh, discretionary disposable income and, and the, the price of the things that they are forced to consume that they have absolutely no discretion around has gone through the roof. And of course, they have to cut back somewhere if they're not prepared to put that on a credit card, which concerningly a significant number seem to be. So unfortunately, this was always where we were going to end up. The speed at which we've got here, I think, has surprised some of us. Um, but the reality is the jobs market on the face of it still looks relatively strong. And that means we've got further weakness ahead. Jobs market data still ahead. James Nathy, Julie Bill sticking with us. Futures down about six or seven tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. Last month, the S&P up nine percent over last month. A monster move. Looking at Treasury yields, we've come back a mile from where we were on June 14th. Close to 350 on a 10-year. Right now, your 10-year yield down another basis point to 264, sub 264, 263.78 on a 10-year right now. About 18 minutes away from the opening bell. Let's get you some movers. We can do that with Abby. John, well, relative to U.S. futures, that S&P 500 in particular nose diving right around 8 a.m. It has to do with one stock because of head of the announcement that Apple is doing another four-part bond sale to fund both dividends and buybacks. The S&P 500 had been slightly higher, but you can see Apple itself down about nine tenths of one percent. This is the fifth bond offering in two plus years. It's interesting to note those other four times the stock did close higher. Boeing popping nicely higher, up 3.9 percent on the possible St. Louis area strike being on hold until at least Wednesday. Room for new labor contract. Plus, uh, they have the possibility of more 787 deliveries could resume after a hurdle with the FAA being cleared. HSBC sharply higher, up 7 percent on a surprise earnings beat, plus plans to resume the dividend. And then finally, Celsius, the holding company for low calorie drinks. PepsiCo is taking an 8.5 percent stake, a 550 million stake uh, at 75 million at $75 per share, John. There is, however, a 15% bearish short interest on the shares of Celsius, so that probably helps to explain that big pop higher. That is the sound of a squeeze that you hear. Abby, thank you. Tom, very excited about that story. I've got no idea why. As Bramo pointed out, just some signs of corporate activity this morning on the debt side with Apple and then again with PepsiCo on the equity side, as Abigail pointed out. Coming up, the story of the moment, Speaker Pelosi's potential visit to Taiwan. It's it's we're, I'm very excited if, should we go uh, to the countries that we're, we you'll be hearing about along the way uh, about how the, the conversations we have now. The list of the countries on her tour coming up next.
This is fighting inflation. This is all about the, the absolute horrible uh, position that people are in now because of the uh, inflation cost, whether it be gasoline, whether it be food pricing, whether it be energy pricing. And it's around energy mostly it's driving these high inflation. This is going to do, take care of that because this is aggressively producing more energy to get more supply to get the prices down. That's what we're doing. Things getting a little bit better for the president at home, a little more contentious abroad. At home, looking to pass the Democrats' new Inflation Reduction Act. Abroad, Speaker Pelosi heading to Asia amid simmering tensions with China. CNN reporting that Speaker Pelosi is expected to visit Taiwan, citing unnamed Taiwanese and U.S. officials. Down in D.C., let's get to AMH. Anne-Marie Moore reporting from the Liberty Times in the last 30 minutes that the Speaker of the House is expected to land in Taiwan tomorrow night. Yeah, and exactly, Jonathan. That's just about 24 hours from now because she's in Singapore where it's 9.15 p.m., where it also is in Taipei. And Liberty Times is uh, one of the main newspapers in Taiwan reporting that the Speaker of the House will be coming to the country. Jonathan, we heard it already this morning from China's foreign ministry, the same kind of rhetoric we've been hearing for days, saying that the PLA will not sit idly by if Speaker Pelosi comes to Taiwan, um, given her rank as the third highest uh, level official from the United States. And ready over the weekend, we saw live drills in the province directly across from Taiwan. And we should note that today, the People's Liberation Army, China's Army, the PLA, is actually celebrating their 95th anniversary. So tensions are very high at this moment, uh, at potentially this trip, which we should note over the weekend, Speaker Pelosi and her itinerary did not foreshadow this. This was one of the items left off. And Marie, we caught up with Isaac Boltanski last week of BTIG. Take a listen to what he had to say about this potential visit. It feels incredibly difficult for her to pull back at this stage. My sense is that she's going to have to go to Taiwan. As we see geopolitical tensions um, continue to mount with China over Taiwan and over other issues, um, the most that we're going to see are these targeted, narrow set of tariff relaxations focused on consumer goods. AMH, he called this a lose-lose situation. Mm. Is this a lose-lose situation? So for Beijing side, they're talking tough rhetoric, which basically means there's a risk that there could be potentially some dramatic uh, influence from the PLA uh, with Speaker Pelosi's trip. What they exactly do, we do not know, but maybe some intimidation. And then, of course, on the uh, U.S. side, this is difficult because now that this was already put in the press, it was also supposed to go in April, but she got COVID. How does she walk this back? Her Republican colleagues are actually also pushing her to make sure they take this trip. So if she calls it off or the White House asks her to call it off, then the United States looks like they are not talking tough ahead of to China, and we are about 100 days out from the midterm election. So for both sides, it could potentially be a lose-lose, and it is a huge risk. We should also note, while this is happening, you have delegations from China and the United States also working on the first in-person meeting for Xi Jinping and President Biden of his administration. Well, that's getting harder and harder to sort out. AMH Anne-Marie down in D.C., more from Anne-Marie through the damn Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. James Athey, let me speak to the trader in you. How will you navigate this headline risk? Risk going into tomorrow and through tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. As with all headline risk, right, you just see, I don't know, the comments from a potential Italian Prime Minister um, Maloney on Friday and the, the effect that that had on BTPs and BTP spreads. There's no way you could have known that headline was coming. There's no way you could have managed that risk. Unfortunately, it's likely to be a bit similar with the Taiwan situation. It feels entirely unnecessary to me. I agree with, with Anne-Marie that at this point, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. But showing weakness at the very last minute is probably from a political calculus, the worst option. Therefore, I would guesstimate that the risks are towards risk off downside headlines, particularly given, uh, you know, equities have squeezed all the way up to the 100 day moving average in S&P and uh, look particularly prone to me given the deteriorating uh, growth and earnings outlook. So it's not something I'm going to try and position for. It's something I'm going to be aware of. I think the risks are in my favor because broadly speaking, I'm defensively positioned. Um, but, you know, it's just one of those you'll just have to watch and see bombs go off if and when. And by bombs, I, of course, mean headline bombs, not actual bombs. And equities down and down hard. Futures down by 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P 500.
Judy Peel, you look abroad right now, you've got the situation with China over things like Taiwan. You've got the situation within China. The data's not great at all. You've got the FX backdrop of a strong dollar through much of this year, the weakness in Europe. Judy, from your perspective, do you just focus at home? Focus at home and look at what's happening here and try and push out some of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look broadly speaking, I would prefer to stay domestically focused, particularly on smaller businesses that are easy to understand and that have you know, a better control over their destiny. Having FX into the mix makes things extremely complicated. And I appreciate that investors say, well, that's fine. We're just going to look at constant currency results. But at the end of the day, if your product is more expensive because of currency, it's less competitive. So for us, we're definitely focusing on companies that are at home. It makes it easier for lazy people like me. That's a good thing. And it makes it easier, too, because I don't need to keep track of Nancy Pelosi's vacations. I just wish she'd take a carnival cruise like everyone else. I'm it's sure certain officials down in D.C. might share that sentiment right now. Judy Bill. James Athey, to the both of you, thank you. Right now, futures are down on this by three quarters of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields look like this on a 10-year. We come in just a little bit. It's not a monster move. We're down a basis point on a 10-year to 264. And that's been the direction of travel pretty much since we topped on June 14th. Coming up, the morning calls and later. JP Morgan's David Leibovitz does not see a pivot. He's looking for more Fed hikes. We'll speak to him around the opening bell. From New York, this is Bloomberg. minutes away from the opening bow in New York City this morning. Good morning. Five minutes away from the opening bow with risk over Taiwan very much on the horizon. A focus for many market participants through the next 24 hours. Will she or won't she, the Speaker of the House, visit Taiwan? Futures down by about six or seven tenths of one percent on the S&P. For the bond market, some pushback over Fed expectations from both current and former Fed officials. Yields come in by not even a basis point. We're higher. We're moving the other way by a basis point on a two-year to 289.64. Down a basis point on a 10-year to 263.42. That's the story of the bond market. That's the price action. Here's some morning calls. Wells Fargo upgrading target to overweight 195 price target, seeing an attractive buying opportunity following recent declines. Barclays downgrading Comcast to equal weight, expecting slower growth with cable providers starting to resemble telecom companies. And finally, Jefferies downgrading Bumble to hold, highlighting a challenging macro environment and worsening FX headwinds. They're through the calls. Coming up, Wall Street divided following a monster equity rally in July. JP Morgan's David Leibovitz sees big tech starting to look a little bit more attractive. That conversation, up next. Twenty-four seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning to you. The market shaping up as follows. Futures down seven tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by about six tenths of one percent. The focus on Speaker Pelosi's tour of Asia. Will she or won't she head to Taiwan? There's your opening bow. Switch on the board and get to the bond market. Yield shaping up as follows on a ten-year down a basis point to 263.42 and way off the highs of the year, close to 350 back on June 14th. That is when real yields topped as well. And the market bottom, the equity market bottomed two days later. And we ripped on the Nasdaq. And then we went into July and had a monster month as well. We're coming off the best month of gains on the S&P since November 2020. I'm 9% there on the Nasdaq 100, up by about 12.5%. Last month alone, that good. And off the lows of June, much more so. About 25 seconds into this, we are negative five or six tenths of 1% on the S&P. Let's get you some movers. We can do that with Katie Greifeld. Well, it's hard for the index to rally with one of the biggest stocks under pressure. That's the case with Apple today. Of course, shares falling after the company, a report that the company will kick off a four-port part bond sale, rather, with dividends, buybacks in focus. Usually Apple rallies after these sorts of announcements. Not the case today so far. You also have on semi lower. The chipmaker reported earnings earlier and revenue beat estimates, but the company said it's, quote, sensitive to dynamic market conditions. Shareholders seem to be taking that as bad news. We'll certainly see. Alibaba, meanwhile, also flipping from a gain to a loss. The company said it's going to strive to keep its U.S. listing. That's after it landed on the SEC's list of Chinese firms 
facing delisting. Shares can't really decide what to do, down about half a percent or so. And finally, Boeing, though, it's solidly higher after a double dose of good news. You have defense workers delaying their strike by at least a few days or so. And Boeing also got the next step in deliveries for its 787 Dreamliners. Dreamliners, rather. That's been on hold since 2020. Shares up almost 5%, John. Kelly, thank you. About 90 seconds into this one, we are decidedly lower. We're down six-tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're lower. On the Nasdaq, we're down seven-tenths of 1%. This morning really started with the news report from CNN reporting that Speaker Pelosi is expected to visit Taiwan as part of her tour of Asia. They went on to say that this was according to a senior Taiwanese government official and a U.S. official as well. That was backed up a couple of hours later from the Liberty Times, who said House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expected to land in Taiwan on Tuesday night local time. You saw the equity market gap lower. You saw this currency pair pop higher. That is dollar CNH. That's the offshore yuan. And right now we're seeing a move of about six tenths of one percent to six seventy eight ninety two. This is going to be a big market story for the next 24 hours and one we'll keep our eye on for you as these headlines pour in. We've got to keep our eye on earnings too. Another busy stretch of earnings with 20% of the S&P 500 market cap reporting this week after recording the best month again since 2020. Let's get back to Abby for more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, indeed, it is going to be a busy week for earnings. And with that big gain for the S&P 500 last month, not surprisingly, perhaps the overall headline for the earnings season so far is less bad or better than feared. And this, of course, as there were some beats, surprisingly, because there had been such a negative sentiment going into the June quarter earnings report, uh, sales beat by 2.1% on average. Earnings by 4.2%, which is interesting. It tells you investors or, excuse me, companies, management teams are really managing to uh, manage costs. And then, of course, there's the one-day move. Not surprisingly, with that big gain for the S&P 500 of 9% in July, up 7 tenths of 1% on the day. Now, this week, as you were mentioning, 20% of the S&P 500 at stake, $2.1 trillion of market cap to report mixed among discretionary and staple sectors, among others. Tomorrow, We'll have AMD, Uber, Caterpillar, and Starbucks to give you an idea of industrials and discretionary companies that are reporting. And then healthcare, that's the one big single uh, sector represented this week, $1.4 trillion worth of market cap. Eli Lilly and Amgen report on Thursday, CVS on Friday. But, John, it's not just the micro. It's also the macro. You were talking about Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. We, of course, also have seasonality. Now, most folks tend to think that October is the worst month for stock given 1929, 1987, 2008, but it's actually August and September. Over the last 25 years, both of these uh, in August down six tenths of one percent. Don't forget Black Monday back in uh, 2015 and 2011. We have a big crash down seven tenths of one percent in September. And strategist Jonathan Krimsky over at BTIG, he thinks that July it was just a counter trend rally. Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, as you know, agree. On the other hand, JP Morgan thinks that they could there could be uh, some sort of positive outlook for the rest of the year. I think the main theme, the main idea, John, fasten the seatbelt. This has been the move that Marco Kalanovic over at JP Morgan has been looking for for a long, long time. Abby, thank you. Thank you so much. Looking ahead to the week ahead, we've got to talk about earnings as well. The ISM manufacturing number coming out a little bit later this morning. In about 25 minutes' time, Guy Johnson and Alex Steele will go out through that for you. We'll get the PMI from S&P Global as well for manufacturing in America in around about 10 minutes or so. Then on to tomorrow, jolts after that, you'll get more claims data on Thursday in between the ISM services index and onto payrolls on Friday too. Looking for 250k on payrolls, down from 372. The story so far, a dovish interpretation of Chairman Powell on Wednesday. Expecting some pushback to that in the coming weeks, I'm sure, from Fed speakers. Reinforced by a downside surprise on GDP. That sparked another upside move, another leg higher, after a monster rally through most of July already. All of this stoking questions over whether it can continue. In terms of equity markets, they've rallied considerably in July. You have also had a, an OK earnings season. In the Fed that just sort of stayed on scripts. Seemingly quite a dovish uh, tone and rhetoric. Didn't, you know, provide an additional negative catalyst into the market. It probably is a bear market rally. Expectations just got, you know, so extremely low that it didn't take a whole lot to kind of surprise. Thinking about what does the equity market look like from here? We'd like to see some follow through. We're going to need to see more reassurance that interest rates aren't going to come back. We still are coming off of quite high readings on inflation. Until the Fed seems comfortable that inflation's under control. This doesn't feel like a stable equilibrium to me. I don't think I call it a bull market. More in the kind of bear market rally, less in the you know durable rally camp. This is a, a bear market rally. 
Joining us now is JP Morgan's David Leibovitz. David, you know I'm going to ask you now, is it or isn't it a bear market rally and how on earth do you know? So I, I think it's a bear market rally, and I think you know a lot of the points that have been made um, over the past couple of weeks have have covered this. But any time that that the market is viewing bad news as being good news, I, I always become a little bit skeptical because then you have to ask yourself, you know, is there another shoe to drop? Right? Will there be a bad piece of information that the market just decides is is too negative, and, and that can certainly get things moving in the opposite direction? I, I also think that the market has misread uh, what Powell was saying yes uh, last week, particularly during the press conference. And you know, you have these expectations that the Fed is going to begin to cut rates in 2023. I, I think that, that that is a bit of a stretch. I think if nothing else, we expect the Fed to decrease the magnitude of its rate hikes over the course of the next couple of meetings. But the, the bar for a rate cut feels particularly high. And I think that the market may have gotten that wrong. So I'm going to go with bear market rally here. Uh, but we are more constructive today than we were at the start of the year. So for long term investors, we think that the entry point is becoming more attractive. So David, square that one for me, because some people look at this rally and say it's self-defeating, it's an easing of financial conditions, it's premature, this Fed needs to push back. At the same time, you're becoming more constructive in certain pockets of this market. So tell me where you're more constructive and why Fed pushback won't destroy that story. So I think the first thing to, to keep in mind is that, you know, we're, we're skeptical about how far the Fed is going to get. We, we do see them continuing to hike rates through the end of this year, uh, but then very much believe that, that they will go on pause. Nonetheless, against the backdrop of elevated uncertainty and, and policy rates that are moving higher, we need to focus on the earnings. And so that really means two things for us. Uh, on the one hand, we like companies with operating leverage. We like the industrials. We like the materials. We think that there's probably some juice left uh, in the energy names as well. But at the same time, when we look at what's gone on with the large cap growth names, we recognize that valuations uh, have re-rated significantly. And so I guess one way you could put it, John, is that we're owning value for the growth and we're owning growth for the value uh, in this environment. You're going to confuse me. It's still too early in the week, David. I think I caught <laughs> up with that just about. Savita Subramanian published from Bank of America. She wrote this just moments ago. Was June and the June low the big low? Our bull market signposts say no. She's gone on to say prior bear markets also ended after EPS cuts. We're still in the very early innings of a downturn and estimate cuts. David, you mentioned earnings and how important they are. We're all on the same page. Where are you looking for these cuts to come through? If not energy, and if you like tech just a little bit more relative to where you were, where do you think they're going to be? So I, I think that, you know, the question is more about the magnitude of the cuts more than it's about, you know, will there be cuts uh, in and of themselves? I, I mean, it wouldn't be surprising to see earnings downgraded, particularly for 2023, uh, where consensus estimates are, are just too high. I frankly think that they'll come down uh, effectively across the board. But, you know, the question again is, is how much do they re-rate? And I think that some of the steps that companies are taking today in terms of reducing their expense bill, obviously some certain sectors uh, have had the ability to pass along higher costs in the form of higher prices, and that's helped defend margins as well. You know, this is increasingly becoming a sector by sector and an industry by industry story. And, and as a result, I do think you'll see that wholesale downgrade, uh, albeit for, for slightly different reasons. Equity's getting hit right now, about nine or ten minutes in. We're down six tenths on the SP. On the Nasdaq, we're down four tenths. A small cap suffering, the Russell down by 1.3%. David, in a moment, you and I will talk about the data. We'll get a PMI final read for July in about four or five minutes. We'll break that down with Mike McKeon. I'll come to you. Before we get there, can you just walk me through how you expect the bond side of a portfolio to perform in the environment you're anticipating if things do get a little more tricky for this equity market in the weeks and months ahead? So I think that everybody has a bad taste in their mouth, given what went on at the beginning of this year when we saw stock bond correlations uh, turn positive. At that time, inflation was very much in the driver's seat. The Fed was very much in the driver's seat. Uh, people weren't worried about a negative shock to growth. And so, you know, by my lights, now that the questions are more around the growth side of the equation in the current environment, that slower growth could be what allows bonds to actually help investors play defense, um, you know, if things continue to look like they're getting softer. Savita, as I said, from Bank of America said we might not have seen the low in this equity market. Do you think we might have seen the high on a 10-year yield, David? I think that we have seen the high on the 10-year yield. And I think if nothing else, what requires what, what the equity market will require uh, in order to behave a bit better is, is stabilization on the interest rate front. Interest rate volatility is still entirely too high for equities to find their footing. And so I do think we need to take a cue from rates when thinking about the broader story around risk assets. A curve a bit flatter this morning. The two-year up a basis point, the 10-year down a basis point. David, you're going to stick with us, I'm pleased to say, to break down some of that economic data with Mike McKee and talk about this U.S. economy in about four or five minutes. 
minutes. So yields come in a couple of basis points on a 10 year 263. In the equity market, about 11 minutes into this, we are lower by a half of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about four or five tenths of 1%. Coming up, investors look into a host of fresh data for signs of a potential recession. It's going to be important what we see in the labor market. It's going to be important what we end up seeing in the PMI numbers between now and September. A ton of economic data coming up this week and a ton of Fed speak expected as well. That conversation just ahead. It's going to be important what we see in the labor market. It's going to be important what we end up seeing in the PMI numbers between now and September. Ultimately, in order to get the market to start moving higher in yield again, you're really going to need to see growth data rebound. Not seeing that right now. Just getting some data from S&P Global. Let's get to it. Here's Mike McKee. Well, John, we get the S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing PMI, and it's not all that bad. It's still expanding. 52.2 is the number for the month of July. The final read there, it was 52.3 last month. So it is not showing signs of collapse in U.S. manufacturing, unlike we're seeing elsewhere in the world. You take a look at what's happened. We've got PMIs from everywhere from the weekend into today, and they basically show manufacturing has just stalled out. The Chinese are showing contraction. Germany, France, Italy, and the Eurozone all falling. The surprise is your UK, John. All we hear and see is headlines about how miserable everything is, but they're still expanding at 51.1. Just miserable people, Mike. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> well, go Lionesses. They, they won yesterday. All right. The the uh, big number uh, of the day is going to be the ISM PMI here in the United States. And uh, one thing is we're seeing we, we have a different kind of manufacturing here uh, than the, a different kind of problem here. We don't have the supply chain problems that China and Europe are having right now. And that is expected to come in at 52 down from 53, but still showing expansion. That's at the top of the hour. What do you make of ISM services later this week, Mike, given what we saw in the PMI in the last couple of weeks? Well, that's going to be interesting because we did see drops in PMIs in Europe, and we've seen it in China as well, although they're still positive. So the question is, uh, did people cut back on spending or did they do more spending? We thought they would do more in the service area, but the GDP and uh, spending numbers showed for July. They didn't. They still bought more goods. So it'll be an interesting uh, number to look at. My final word just on payrolls coming up Friday. You and I will have plenty of opportunities to talk about this, but what are you are looking for going into this week? Well, you're looking for a slowdown. That's what the Fed's been looking for. But we get jolts on Wednesday, and that'll show us if we've started losing some of those open jobs. And we're not expecting any change in unemployment, according to the economists we've surveyed. So at this point, it's kind of status quo in the labor market, which Jay Powell says gives them room to keep cutting. Do we see some heat come out of this labor market, and does that jolt stay to capture that? with some reduced job openings. Mike, thank you. We're about 17 minutes into this. We're down four tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a third. We recover just a little bit. As Mike, McP Mike McKee pointed out, I know Mike very well. I'll pronounce his name properly. Mike McKee pointed out in about 13 minutes, you'll get the ISM data on the manufacturing side in just a moment. JP Morgan's David Leibovitz wrote this. The economy is losing momentum. However, the Fed will continue to tighten. But it is not clear that the Fed can reduce labor demand job openings without pushing the unemployment rate higher. David's back with us for more. David, your thoughts on the data and just on that conclusion. If we're going to push the unemployment rate higher, does that mean we ultimately have to push this economy into a recession? So I, I think that there, there are two things there. I think, one, the, the PMIs obviously give us a very good look <clears throat> at data more in, in real time. And, you know, rather than debating 52 versus 53, I think what will be interesting to look at the trends that are emerging uh, across manufacturing, manufacturing relative to services, because a thesis that a lot of people have had up until this point is that, the manufacturing numbers should begin to get a bit softer, uh, but the services numbers are, are going to hang in there. Uh, regardless, the, the question is about the labor market. And, and I think what is so challenging in the current environment is that you know, labor is, is the one thing that people continue to cite as, as keeping us out of recession. Um, in order to deal with the inflation problem, it does feel like we need to have a recession. If you look back at the data to 1960, mid-cycle slowdowns do one thing. They prevent inflation from continuing to rise. They do not get inflation to 
to fall. And so it does feel like a recession, albeit a mild recession, is becoming a foregone conclusion if we're going to put this inflation genie back into the bottle. Uh, the silver lining here is that when we look at the most cyclical parts of the economy, things like housing, business investment, inventories, and autos, nothing looks terribly off sides. And that does reinforce our conviction uh, that any downturn in the economy would be relatively manageable uh, and hopefully get inflation to a spot that makes investors and the Fed feel a bit more comfortable. David, what do you think the biggest risk around that view is right now? Because you and I can both appreciate that's quickly become the consensus view that if it's recession and many people think it already is, it's short, it's shallow. What do you think the biggest risk around that view is? So, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about that, and I've heard various other folks kind of espouse their, their theories. Um, I think that the big risk there is that, you know, we end up seeing some sort of liquidity or, or balance sheet issue. I think one of the, the big distinctions uh, of the current environment relative to what we saw in the run-up to 08 and relative to what we saw during 2020 was that we see the potential for a balance sheet recession as, as being limited. But there's been massive wealth destruction so far this year. People are hanging on because incomes are growing and they do have accumulated savings, albeit they're not interested in seemingly spending uh, those accumulated savings. I think that a balance sheet recession, something that really squeezes the consumer like we've seen over the past two downturns, uh, is the biggest downside risk to our base case view. Just quickly then, one final question from me, David, and I'll let you run. And thanks for all your time this morning. It's really important to us. Just a final question. Do you expect the weakness that we're starting to see evolve spill over into the labor market this quarter, or is that too soon? So I think that you are going to see the labor market numbers begin to soften. Um, I've always been a big fan of jobless claims because it comes out every week and the claims data has been steadily marching higher uh, over the past couple of weeks. And so I think that in concert with what you're hearing from corporations during earnings season around expense management leads me to believe that the labor market numbers are going to begin to get a bit softer here uh, over the course of the coming months. David, thank you, buddy. As always, good to catch up. David Leibovitz there of JP Morgan Asset Management. About 21 minutes into this, we're down a third of 1% recovering slowly on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100. We're lower on the Nasdaq. We're down about two-tenths of 1%. Abby, we've got to catch up about that Apple story. They are very, very good at timing this debt market. They certainly are, John. And it's interesting because you were just mentioning futures off the lows. That has a lot to do with Apple because after announcing that four-part bond deal, uh, that 40-year deal, about 140 bips above 150 basis points over Treasuries, Apple had been down about 1%. That had really dragged on the markets. No moments ago, up three-tenths of 1% up slightly right now. But to your point about timing it really well, of course, in the back half of July, we saw this big rebound in credit as investors and traders became more optimistic. So Apple taking advantage of that to fund corporate uh, uses, mainly dividends and buybacks, according to one source. But they have no shortage of cash, John, as you know, about $180 billion. And historically, because this is actually the fifth bond offering over the last roughly five years, on the day of the announcement, the stock closes up more than 1%. So today's reversal, no surprise. And if it goes up more than 1%, that would be right in line with the history of Apple. Abby, thank you. Larry McDonald over at the Bear Traps Report sent me a chart months ago of Luca Maestri, the CFO of Apple, just plotting where he issues debt in the credit market and the timing of it and then what happens with credit spreads after they widen, interest rates start to climb. Just a fantastic timer of this credit market, it seems, and I know a lot of people are talking about that this morning, going into potentially a busier August relative to what we've seen so, so far this year, so far this summer on the supply side. Just one thing to watch. Here's another, of course, Speaker Pelosi and her trip to Asia. Will she or won't she land in Taiwan? That is a huge, huge focus of this market now, going into tomorrow off the back of recent reports suggesting she could be landing there tomorrow night, local time. We'll build on that story through the day on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Coming up, I'll get you the trading diary, the expected scheduled events of the week ahead. And there are many from New York. This is Bloomberg.
coming off the back of the biggest month of gains on the S&P 500 since November 2020. About 25 minutes into the month of August, we are lower by about a tenth of 1%. No drama here, just a bit softer, lower, negative, lighter on the S&P. Add a little bit more weight to the Nasdaq 100, up about a third of 1% or so. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. At the top of the hour, ISM manufacturing numbers coming out. Speaker Pelosi continues her tour of Asia in Singapore. Plus, tomorrow, Fed speak from Evans, Bullard and Mester on Tuesday, along with the US jolts report. A Bank of England rate decision and initial jobless claims coming up on Thursday. Some talk of 50 basis points on Threadneedle Street later this week from Governor Bailey in the Bank of England. And finally, we round down the week with the main event on Friday. It's the US payrolls report and I can tell you a ton of data in between. We're looking for 250k on Friday. The range, the high 320, the low is 50. From New York, this was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.